now gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Tony Holland. Uh, Professor Holland, who is PWSA UK's patron, trained in medicine at University College and University College Hospital, London, qualifying in 1973. After some years in general medicine, he trained in psychiatry at the Maudsley Hospital and Institute of Psychiatry in London. From 1992 to 2002, he held a university lecturer's post in the section of developmental psychiatry in the University of Cambridge, and in 2002 was awarded the Health Foundation Chair in Learning Disability, establishing the Cambridge Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Group. This multidisciplinary group undertakes a broad range of research relevant to people with intellectual disabilities. His specific interests include the eating, behavioral, and mental health problems associated with Prader-Willi syndrome, and also clinical legal issues relevant to the needs of people with intellectual disabilities. In 2010, he was a elected a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and awarded a CBE by the Queen in 2015. Professor Holland is also president of the International Prader-Willi Syndrome Organization. Tony, welcome. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you for inviting me here today. And can I also uh, extend my congratulations? Well, thanks to all that you've done, Susan, over the years. I think it's fair to say I've been involved with the association over the, not quite, but almost over the 40 years of its existence. And it did go through a bit of a rocky stage, and I think you have pulled it together again, and, and it's now a strong and robust organization that is facing some of the complex challenges that we're here, here today to discuss and you will all be uh, familiar with. Um, also, just to say that I can remember so vividly meeting what was then Rosemary, was it Rosemary Erskine, Jackie, or Rosemary Johnson? Uh, Ros yeah, Ro who was the well, chair of the, of the first of the prader willi Syndrome Association at that time. And I, I got the train out of London. I was at the Maudsley at the time. I'd seen the first person I ever saw with prader willi syndrome. I was completely mystified. So I phoned up the association, got the train to Woking, I think it was, where Rosemary lived, and got off the train. And Rosemary was an extraordinarily feisty <laughs> person, as Jackie here can testify to, and others, I'm sure, can testify to. And I, it sort of took my breath away a, a little bit. But... I got engaged with the whole field at that time and have remained involved, seeing people clinically, being part of this organization and the international organization and undertaking research uh, ever since then. And it's been wonderful. It's a fantastic national and international community of, of people. So today I've been asked to reflect again really on something that's now been around for a while and that's the uh, Mental Capacity Act for England and Wales. Scotland has its, its own act that addresses this issue. And this, like all things in this field, is also a complex issue. And um, what I'm going to try and do is really work through the framework of the act and ask about what it is about having Prader-Willi syndrome and the environment that people with Prader-Willi syndrome live in that makes this such an important issue for helping to resolve some of the dilemmas that happen, particularly in transition and throughout adult life. So in preparing this talk, I thought I would actually start briefly by just talking a little bit about transition to adulthood, because the Mental Capacity Act only comes into effect in adult life, really from age 16, but certainly from age 18 onwards, and it's about making decisions, it's about consent and issues of choice and independence. And it's often in transition that things go wrong and then something like the Mental Capacity Act may be an important part of finding a route to, route through solving these particular problems. So I just want to start in a moment by reflecting on that issue of transition. Then I want to ask issues, questions about what is it about Prader-Willi syndrome that may impact on someone's decision-making capacity, and particularly their ability to act in accordance with their wishes and values. People with Prader-Willi syndrome may well tell you 
that they want a more independent life, but they also want a healthy life and a fulfilling life. They know, often they'll tell you they know it's important to keep healthy and to keep healthy you need to not to be severely obese. But actually when it comes to acting these things out, things may fall apart. So I want to just reflect on that issue a bit. Then obviously focus on the Mental Capacity Act and how we think about that. Then at the end, um, there will be time for questions and discussion, I, I, I hope. If there are any particular issues that are raised during the course of the talk that you feel you must ask about, please do. I, I, I don't mind at all being interrupted. Some of my slides are a bit full, and I, it, all of us have this problem of not learning, that we actually should have much less on a slide, but I apologize for that, but I'm sure you, you will have copy, you can be sent copies of this slide. So this issue of transition to adult life, and there's a paper that I've just in the top right-hand corner um, that was uh, led by a, a group of us were invited to contribute to, and it's published in Endocrine Connections. And I just want to reflect on three issues and then some of the uh, issues that follow from that. I've used this phrase at the top there, maintaining homeostasis in a changing world. Homeostasis is generally thought of as a biological process whereby the, modern, the body attains st uh, maintains stability, uh, both at the level of the cell as well as the organ systems and the body itself. But actually, there's it should be conceptualized, I think, as wider than that. It's the ability that we all have to respond to the demands of a changing world. But the most obvious example of that is temperature change. We, s we sweat if we're too hot, and we shiver if we're too cold. This is part of homeostasis. But also increasingly, people see things like uh, energy balance, managing your energy intake to, to match your energy needs is part of homeostasis but also feelings of happiness and sadness are ways of responding to demands that happen in the environment, or circumstances in the environment. And I think this is one of the core issues, and I, I'll be coming back to this in some of the workshop, re workshops later. One of the core issues about Prader-Willi syndrome is that people with Prader-Willi syndrome struggle at so many levels in managing, maintaining stability within a, an inevitably demanding and changing world. And this becomes much more of an issue in adult life where they may not have the protection of the family around them and so on. Secondly, that in adult life you get increasing freedoms, choices and risks. And of course, you have the right to make decisions for yourself. And there are certain issues about Prader-Willi syndrome that I think impact on that person's ability in so many different ways to, as I say, to manage uh, the demands of a changing environment and to make decisions and so on and so forth. It may be their cognitive ability, in including their social cognition, that's the ability to, to manage in a social world, if you like. Obviously, the hyperphagia, the overeating, the fact that they may have difficulty managing their emotions and emotional regulation and the risk of outbursts. And then there's also the risk, perhaps more strikingly in those with the UPD form of Prader-Willi syndrome, of mental ill health in their teenage years or early adult life. But it's also important to set that within the context of the environment. And there are things about the environment that may make transition easier or more complex. Because at that time, you'd be moving perhaps from a structured environment to an unstructured and sometimes chaotic environment of adult life. You may have access to food, whether you think that's right or not is another matter, but that, that may be the, the circumstances that someone moves from a food uh, secure environment to an unstructured food environment. They move from situations of some certainty and familiarity to situations of some uncertainty. There's increasing choice and independence, and much of this will be dependent also on the level of support uh, that they have. This is the context of transition. And it's this context that the Mental Capacity Act may become important in. And that's why I spent just a few minutes really setting the scene from that perspective. So in adult life, it becomes increasingly important. I mean, in childhood, you want obviously the ascent of your child with Prader-Willi syndrome to do the things that you know to be right and healthy for, for, for your child. But in adult life, these things become more important and consent becomes a really important issue. 
in terms of um, what someone can and cannot, cannot do. And as part of that, as I'll come to capacity or the ability to use and balance the relevant information and to be able to communicate or wishes and so on becomes important for all of us as we move from childhood through adolescence into adult life. That under those circumstances, it's certainly appropriate to help inform. In fact, it's necessary to inform and provide knowledge for that person of Prada Willis syndrome in making those decisions. You can maybe support and guide them in their decision making, but you can't coerce them into that decision uh, situation. And then there would be another issue that will arise and we'll come back to in terms of the circumstances that they are living in and whether those uh, situations have some restrictions, which may well do around food and perhaps should do around food, and whether those restrictions reach a level that they would be defined in law as a deprivation of liberty. Now, these are just some of the issues, and I'll be coming back to these, uh, that is important in terms of thinking about where the Mental Capacity Act uh, becomes relevant. So in terms of preparing the transition, I think one of the really striking things in all the years that, that I've been involved in this field is that, of course, for when, I, when I first met, uh, met Jackie, um, uh, when she was leading the prada willi Syndrome Association all those years ago, the majority of people hadn't been diagnosed for many years. So there wasn't the opportunity for the families to help guide their child about what it means to have prada willi Syndrome so their child understood those issues. So we now see and would expect a diagnosis within a few days, if not a few weeks, and no longer than a few weeks um, after birth. And I think that has been one of the really important issues. So I think part of what you're seeing in the newer generation of children with Prader-Willi syndrome is they have a better sense of what it means to have Prader-Willi syndrome in the same way as someone with some other form of disability may understand their strengths and their, their limitations. I think also we're much more understanding about the benefits of a food secure environment. I think we're also uh, much more aware of strategies to help manage change and, um, and, and emotions and how important that is in trying to prepare your child as they get older and move towards transition. I think also education, if you can, and, and that, that you've heard that that may be a challenge, but if you can get the right form of educational support for your child, you can help optimize function and ability so they are better prepared for adult life. There are structures in place which may not always be followed, but they are there to try and engage in the transition pro, uh, process. And one can perhaps try and prepare and plan for the future in terms of where to live, the level and nature of the, of the support the person uh, is entitled to and should receive. You can make certain of the good social and family networks. And in, a one, in an ideal world, you might even have employment, although that maybe remains a big, a big issue. So what I sort of want to now move, and, and I, I want to just qualify this, that, that I'll be giving some examples where things clearly have gone wrong, um, but things also that go right. And I don't know, I hope that the majority of times things go right. And of course, I, I suspect that the association primarily hears about things when they've gone wrong. Uh, you only hear about things when gone wrong. It actually, sometimes I think it would be nice if someone would phone the association and say, actually things have gone really well in transition. Because I do think we sometimes get a rather distorted view. I do think there is hope and I do believe strongly that things can work out well and do work out well for many people with prada willi syndrome. But I will be talking about when things haven't worked out well. So I just qualify that that doesn't mean it's always going to be like that or it's like that for everyone. So what's the sort of problems that arise well, someone with Prader-Willi syndrome now, an adult, doesn't assent or consent to, care to a care plan and s insists on living in an environment that is predicted to or has been shown to bring risk. Of course, classically, that is uh, a food insecure environment. Or someone with Prader-Willi syndrome refuses medical treatment for potentially serious health problems such as diabetes, sleep apnea, or mental illness. The question, of course, is, what should happen under those circumstances. This is just the top of a, a banner from a, a paper that 
um, Elizabeth Festine, who works at the University of Cambridge. She's a psychiatrist, but also has a, a, a legal training and a legal background. She and some colleagues undertook this review on behalf of the International Prada Willis Syndrome Organization of case law that had been published in, in, in English legal uh, literature uh, relating to people with Prada Willis Syndrome. And we asked the question, you know, what do the courts think when it goes as far as the courts? What do the courts think of the sort of criteria that might be uh, uh, allow you, in a sense, to take control of that person's life if they're behaving in a way that's getting them into, into difficulties? Um, and, of course, the issue that comes up all the time is how do you balance when you when someone is an adult, respect for the rights of that person with prada willi syndrome, but then on the, on the other hand, the provision of good care that keeps them safe and free from serious risk of harm or risk of serious harm. And there are cases where disagreements around the best way to care for persons with prada willi syndrome that have resulted in harm, and in some cases in, in death. And we were talking uh, early, earlier um, about some of the very tragic coroner's hearings that there have been recently in this country. Uh, the particular case here that um, Elizabeth and her colleagues were re referring to is in, in America, where a young man with prada willi syndrome insists on leaving the house and walking down a road, and the, the staff did a lot to try and protect him, um, but he was hit by a, a car and, and, and died. And it is one of the real challenges when you, and I've seen people who uh, may climb out of windows or leave houses for reasons that are not clear and put themselves in danger. So the danger isn't necessarily one around eating. It can be something rather different. And the question, of course, that comes up is, what can you do about it? But here is someone who was in Cambridgeshire, and I think, you know, and I, I'm now retired from clinical practice, but I don't think we succeeded at all here. It was a constant struggle, and I know it remains a struggle to this day. But you know, he was uh, 24 since age 18. He'd lived in over 10 residential placements, because and each breaking down because of his behaviour. But there were periods of marked weight increase, and then there might be a period when it was possible to help him lose weight. Um, but the breakdown was largely because of aggression, uh, and that he would put himself in positions of clear harm um, and risk of exploitation. These are the sorts of issues in which when, it's, when you get involved in them, you think you know, maybe this is a case for where the Mental Capacity Act starts to becoming relevant and the issue of capacity is particularly important. Now, as you will all be aware, the key question, of course, is as an adult, what renders an action lawful? And, and I, I'm slightly nervous here. I, as Jennifer is a, a, a law expert here in the audience, and she will correct me if I say something that is that is wrong from a legal point of view. Um, but what renders an action lawful is the valid and informed consent of the person. So you as an adult may choose to enter into a contract and that is a valid contract provided you understood, you had the information provided, uh, that you entered into that contract voluntarily and that you had the capacity to understand uh, what, what was going on. For someone with prada willi syndrome, the same applies once they're an adult but there are things around them that might actually increase or decrease their abilities under these circumstances. To what extent do they have support? To what extent have they been used to ideas of choice and been encouraged and supported in making choices, perhaps in other areas of their life? Have they had opportunities that allow them to have a better understanding, for example, about the type of environment they might move to from the family home? Have people made and will people make reasonable adjustments in terms of the care that is being provided, ensuring, for example, that access to food uh, is, is managed? This is the sort of, if you like, a social, legal, almost moral environment that we're dealing with here. The critical importance of consent and how one helps people with Prada Willi syndrome to be informed so that they can make for themselves uh, informed and sensible decisions that respect that will lead to them having good and fulfilling lives that meet their own values and, and wishes. This is a rather full slide, but um, the question then is under what circumstances can you act without the consent of an adult? If I 
came to you and I said, well, I'm a medic and I think you need this injection and I gave you that injection without your consent, that would be assault. What makes that valid is your um, consent, your valid consent. What makes that an acceptable and lawful action is your consent. But there are circumstances where consent can be overridden if it's not required. The criminal justice system being perhaps the best example, the police and courts don't have to say, I need your consent to sentence you or for you to come to trial. Clearly they can override that and they can restrict someone's freedom. What's something would be, false, would be false imprisonment if, if you didn't have the law that allowed the police and the criminal justice system to do that, and they can punish you. There are issues when it comes to people with Prada-Willi syndrome about their fitness to stand trial if they're suspected of an offence or found, uh, and their fitness to plead. Um, and, but I have seen someone with Prada-Willi syndrome who's convicted of quite a serious offence. The courts were willing to consider a probation order. He agreed to it. And he lived, I think it was at one of the Gretton Holmes houses, this was some years ago, did very well over uh, three years, lost a lot of weight, but at the end of his probation order, he left the, the next day, uh, and I, I haven't heard how he is since. The Mental Health Act is another way that one can override consent, so psychiatrists and others can detain and restrict the freedom of someone for the purposes of assessment or treating a person's mental disorder without their consent, providing specific criteria are met. I'm not going to say much more about that. There are circumstances, particularly around if someone with Prader-Willi syndrome has mental illness, where that might be an appropriate thing. But that's something I'm sure we'll discuss in, in the workshop on behavior and mental health. And then there's the Mental Capacity Act, and there's the Mental Capacity Act and the deprivation of liberty safeguards, which apply where someone lacks the capacity to consent to a specific decision due to an impairment of or disability of the mind or brain. And then, interestingly, of course, with coronavirus, there's public health legislation, and there was the Coronavirus Act 2020 that gave public health officers the power to direct and detain potentially infectious uh, persons. Um, so those acts of parliament provide the legal means whereby others determine a particular course of action without the consent of the person Without, legisl without such legislation, um, such action would be unlawful. In each case, specific cr criteria need to be met, although these terms may not always be used in the legislation, but there's general principle that your action should be proportionate and the least restrictive, and there should be a means of appeal, because these are judgments, and I'll come back to that, and uh, there may be uh, a wrong judgment. Um, so, now to begin to narrow down to the Mental Capacity Act. The Mental Capacity Act really provides this legal framework for support and for bal balancing competing options and in a way for managing risks. For it to apply, it requires that someone at the time for the decision in question uh, lacks the capacity to make that decision, and I'll be coming to that, and that if it is judged that that person lacks the capacity to make this particular decision, then someone else can make that decision, the person requiring the decision to be made, providing that they act in that person's best interests. And in order to determine best interests, they must consult. And I'll come back to that. But that, for me, is when I get asked through the association here to get involved in situations where people are talking about the mental capacity, the thing where I think services seem, for me, to fall down so often is in making judgments about best interests. They don't follow the, the, the fact that it requires them to consult people relevant to that person in their, and to their lives, or which parents or siblings may be the obvious people to consult. But the Act requires that that consultation takes place in order that one arrives, arrives at a, a decision about what that decision should be in that person's best, best interests. So why the Mental Capacity Act? And in a way, this came about because there were, um, and there are many others, but there were certain core cases that, that um, were, were challenged and there was no, no ready means for resolving them. For example, there was um, Ray, Ray F. was one of the first that really was a, a lady with severe disabilities and there was issue of sterilization. And that began to develop the idea of best interests. And there was Ray C, who was a man 
held in Broadmoor Special Hospital with mental illness, and there was a question of him needing being uh, advised to have an amputation of his leg because of diabetes and, and gangrene, and he refused. And there was a whole issue about when could someone act against the wishes of that person. And at the time, there was no framework for that, and the Mental Capacity Act then establish that framework. So it set out the circumstances. It sets out the circumstances when an adult can lawfully act on behalf of another adult without his or her consent, when not to act would leave that person open to neglect, exploitation, or abuse. And it sets out the processes and criteria uh, that apply when making that um, decision on behalf of that person, that person who's been judged unable to make that decision for themselves because they lack capacity. Now I, what I want to do, and I just want to step back for a moment, because I think we need to make a distinction between, if you like, a rather broad idea of capacity and competence on the one hand, and the legal definition of capacity on the other. The legal definition of capacity or incapacity as set out in the Mental Capacity Act gives you the framework for the point at which other people can act, or the point before which they can't act, if you like, on behalf of that person. But we also appreciate that there are many people, perhaps with prader willi syndrome or other forms of disability, who may, in other ways, act in ways that are problematic, but they may not necessarily meet the criteria for the legal uh, uh, definition of having lacking, lacking capacity. And this was a... a a diagram that Elizabeth Fistine, who I mentioned earlier, who, who wrote that paper, was one of the key authors on that paper, uh, came up with that actually, of course, what it's about what, what is required of us as adults is to be able to determine for ourselves our particular pursuits and interests in line with the values that we hold, to avoid actions that are inconsistent with our interests and values and also avoid undue influence by the values and interests of others. So you hear about people getting into gangs or whatever, that this is the broader concept of capacity. And there may be people with prada willi syndrome who struggle with some of those, but don't necessarily meet the criteria uh, for incapacity as set out in the Mental Capacity Act. Now, the reason I mention this is that there are people with prada willi syndrome that I think fall within this gray area, that they there's doubt about whether we should say they lack capacity to make a particular decision, but they are clearly vulnerable and they need support and guidance. They may struggle, they, they may try and avoid it and, and refuse it, but, but they are people who, for these sorts of reasons, uh, struggle. So I think it can, somehow be help, it can sometimes be helpful to think about, you know, on, on the left-hand side of the slide, you've got this broad concept of decision-making capacity and incapacity that is associated with vulnerability. Uh, but the expectation is or that this person has the ability to consent to things in their lives. What makes the difference, I think, in those circumstances is support. But tragically, you sometimes hear stories of circumstances where someone with prada willi syndrome is being judged to have capacity to make decisions about where they live. So services say, well, we don't need to worry anymore about them. I would say you need to worry very much about them under those circumstances. Um, just because someone may be judged to lack capacity, to, to have capacity, it doesn't mean to say they don't have real challenges uh, in living in the real world, um, as I really mentioned at the beginning. And then there's a point at which someone will men meet their legal definition of decision-making capacity or incapacity as defined in the Mental Capacity Act and Code of Practice. And then your actions must be in their best interest. And the final bit of this diagram is what's possible in practice. And in a way, that McMullen case that I mentioned earlier, the American case, illustrates the challenge. It may be possible legally to do certain things, but you're trying to balance the whole time this tension between allowing some, some independence and a good life on, the, on one hand and prevention from harm from another. One solution that might have saved that young man's life, of course, would have been to lock all the doors in his house. But, you know, this is the challenge. And sometimes I think one has to recognize that what there are things you may wish to, to do or you can see w would at least solve the problem, 
but they are so intrusive that is it right to do it? Is it possible to do it? And so on and so forth. The other thing, of course, to say is that the Mental Capacity Act doesn't only applies if someone has an impairment of or a disturbance in the functioning of the brain, the mind or brain, that impacts on their decision-making capacity. So having Prader-Willi syndrome, in my view, and I'll come back to this, meets that criteria. So this is um, because of an impairment of or disturbance in the functioning of the brain or mind. People with Prader-Willi syndrome, I think, and this has been one area that is advancing, I think, quite rapidly now, undoubtedly have atypical brain development. And that's indicated both by their developmental history, which is atypical, their cognitive impairments, their functional impairments, but also increasingly by brain scanning neuroimaging studies that have been undertaken, uh, that have shown, for example, most recently, some work we did showed that the hypothalamus, that small nucleus in the center of the brain that's so important in understanding Prader-Willi syndrome is small and poorly developed, even in adults with Prader-Willi syndrome. But also the cortex, the surface of the brain that's important for cognitive function is impaired and is different um, compared to the typically developing population. IQ, IQ is usually, is, is down often in the studies that have been done in the past, and this may be a bit different now, is usually about 40 points below mean, so the mean for a part Prader-Willi syndrome population usually around 60 compared to the mean in the general population of, of 100. There will be some people with Prader-Willi syndrome that have IQs above this magical 70, which is sometimes used as part of the criteria defining intellectual disability, your IQ has to be below 70. But almost invariably, people with Prader-Willi syndrome have an IQ lower than you would expect given their family, family background. So there are a number of things here that clearly determine that it's right to say that people with Prader-Willi syndrome meet that general requirement of the Mental Capacity Act, that before you can ask, do they have capacity to make this particular decision, that they must have an impairment of or disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain? The answer is they do. But it may, the impact of that may vary considerably from individual to, to individual with Prader-Willi syndrome. And that by itself is not enough to say that someone lacks capacity. So here we come, we narrow right down to uh, the issue of how the act defines capacity. So the capacity is seen as decision specific uh, because it depends uh, uh, to some extent on the complexity of the decision in question. So someone with Prader-Willi syndrome is perfectly able to make decisions about what to wear and some aspects of their life and so on but might be judged to lack capacity to make a crucial decision about uh, particular aspects of their care of, or, or whatever. And what it is, they, they, have to be, they have to be unable to understand the information relevant to the decision, to retain that information, to use it and to weigh the information as part of the process of making that decision and unable to communicate that decision by whatever, by whatever means. So this, these are the criteria that the Act has set out above which, if you like, as an adult, you have the right, the judge to have capacity and therefore it's your decision to make. But below which, if you're judged not to have capacity, others then can make that decision on your behalf. It doesn't strictly give them the authority to make that decision. What it does is it gives them freedom from liability. So if afterwards someone challenges them, that person challenged them and said, you took that, you forced me to do that and I didn't want it. The defense that the professional would have would say, I did it because at the time I judged, not only did you have a, an impairment and disability of the mind or brain, but you lacked the capacity to make that decision. And I consulted these people and decided it was in your best interest that this is what we, what we did. So I think in part of that process, it's important that you have to show a link between the fact that this person had Prader-Willi syndrome and the fact that you judge that they can't make this decision for themselves. So one of the questions is, is what's the impact of this particular person's 
cognitive and what I call neuropsychiatric phenotype. The phenotype is the external manifestations of having Prader-Willi syndrome, but including the functional and cognitive abilities of a person. What is it about them that it's affected their ability to act in accordance to their values, will, preferences, and to act in a way that's in their best interests? What can be done to optimize their strengths and mitigate the above factors so they, in fact, do have capacity or that they are much more willing, in a sense, to go along with what everyone sees to be the right course of action and then can live a life that meets their requirements, meets their values, and is in line with, say, set out, something set out like the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disability, that it so encourages people with disability to live more independent lives, making their own choices. So the sorts of things that will be very familiar to you that impact on capacity, uh, um, the, the impact of cognitive function, the impaired emotional regulation, and of course the uh, hyperphagia, the intensity of the in hyperphagia. But also the environment may impact on whether this person can make decisions, the presence or not of food security. And I've seen people with Prader-Willi syndrome who when in food insecure environments, and they're often overweight and there's a real struggle, I think they've, I've judged that they've lacked capacity to make decisions about that. But uh, interestingly, when in food secure environments, they understand the issues and they actually have capacity under those circumstances and realize that they need to live in an environment where food is contained and managed on their, on their behalf. Also, the level of support available to them may make a difference. So again, I've seen someone who's with Prader-Willi syndrome who's trying to live independently and just struggling and struggling and struggling. Whereas if you're in situations of support, those people can help uh, support you, guide you, uh, and provide a sort of scaffold around which you can be kept safe and, and kept physically well. Um, I think previous life experiences may be important and also, again, whether people are making the appropriate adjustments in terms of the style and quality of life that the person uh, is, is leading. So decision-making capacity, how do you uh, assess it? I mean, I think for the first question is to be clear in terms of assessing it is what is the decision in question? Because remember, decision-making capacity is decision-specific. And if I, as a psychiatrist, get instructions from a lawyer about assessing, providing an independent assessment of someone's capacity, they will set out the questions It'll be, um, you know, about can they make decisions about health or about care, or can they make decisions about where to live, can they make decisions about making a will or uh, a lasting power of attorney or whatever it is. Um, they will list those particular uh, issues, can they instruct uh, their, their legal advisor and so on. And of course, what you need to weigh, s sort out there is what does the person need to understand, weigh up and communicate their choice around that particular decision. I think one of the challenges, and this with the code of practice of the act helps a bit and it's case law uh, helps, is what is the threshold of understanding that needs to be a achieved. And that depends to some extent on the seriousness of the decision. So if the decision in question really is particularly, imp is critically important, perhaps in terms of that person's life, then you know, you're, you're going to expect of that quite a high level of understanding before you argue that they have capacity and therefore it's their decision uh, to make. Whereas if it's a relatively minor decision that may not have great um, implications for their life, then the criteria that need to be met may, may be fairly, fairly low. It's important that you may want to present information in small chunks, you may want to use visual material and so on. Um, you need to ask the person to recall the information. Um, and I think decision-making capacity is a process. It's, o it's always a little bit of a problem when one's asked to make an independent decision because actually the people who are best able to make it are perhaps the people who are working with this person uh, all the time and maybe who know the person particularly well in those circumstances. There may be the need for trial and error, and I'll come to that when looking at a case law um, in, a, in a moment. Uh, and whether they have capacity may depend on circumstances. So 
um, again, I remember seeing someone who I judged as lacking capacity. He actually moved to a place where there was good environmental control over food. And the next time I saw him, I felt he had capacity and he was consenting to stay in that environment where food, access to food was controlled. So capacity really is an interaction between someone's functional abilities and the demands of the decision-making uh, task. So in the context of law, of course, decision-making capacity I is pivotal, as I discussed at the beginning of this talk. It sort of has to be black and white, black or white. You can't, just like you can't be a little bit guilty in a criminal court, you're either guilty or not guilty. You can't have a little bit, in terms of a particular decision, a court needs to decide either you have capacity or you don't. Um, but in reality, it may be gray, and there's a real difficulty around circumstances where capacity may fluctuate over time and, and so on. I don't think capacity, as defined in the Mental Health Act, models how we make decisions, but rather what it asks is whether an impairment of or a disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain has affected this person's specific abilities so, so that they can understand and retain and use that information and communicate a choice. I think it's the concept of best interests that becomes important in terms of uh, the person's values and so on. The best interest process, so someone uh, with Prader-Willi syndrome, for example, has tried to live in a food-free um, environment, has put on a lot of weight, um, things have gone badly wrong, and the decision, it's been assessed that this person lacks the capacity to make these decisions for him or herself then the question is what's in their best interest. And I think here, of course, you have to look at their past wishes, their known values. So if someone with Prader-Willi syndrome says, actually, I want to be slim, I want to be able to wear a nice dress or whatever it is, and I want to be able to go out for walks and dance and do these things, but they're acting in a way that is completely contrary to that. So they might say, I can manage my eating perfectly well myself. You don't need to tell me what to do. But it's quite clear that that's not the case. And that miss is a mismatch between their clear wishes and their actions. Then I think you're moving towards arguing that here's someone who lacks capacity. But when thinking about their best interests, they've stated what they wish for. In other words, they're actually almost saying to you they want an environment that will give a, allow me to be physically healthy, to be slim, to enjoy the things that I want to enjoy. You must consult with family and friends, perhaps the paid support workers, and look at the pros and cons of the various options available. Now, decision-making capacity and best interests are not, they are judgments, not certainties, and therefore must be open to challenge and, should, and it should be possible to justify, be justified by those who determine them. And I think that's very important. So again, when I speak to families about this, I say, you need to ask, what is the basis that this judgment was made that your son or daughter did have capacity or didn't have capacity? So through the concepts of best interests, the Mental Capacity Act seeks to achieve a balance between what one might call aspects of autonomy, in other words, those parts of a life the person does understand, is able to make decisions about, and a more parentalistic type of approach where that you have control and you're limiting choice, so it's particularly, say, around food, uh, in order to reduce the risk of harm. So a decision-maker must always act in the person's best interest. And considering at times what may be conflicting rights, conflicting human rights, so to allow someone to have free access to food may be seen allowing them to have personal choice and so on and so forth, but is it actually protecting their right to life? Aren't they likely to die if you allow this to continue or if you allow this behaviour to continue? And this is always tricky. You're trying to balance these things. So the question now is about implementation, what happens you know, so things like with this absence of food security and life-threatening weight gain, someone is leaving their house and putting themselves at risk. For example, those are examples that I mentioned at the beginning. What to do, what is needed, what is legal, what is justifiable and acceptable, and what is possible. Obviously, whatever you do must be legal. 
Um, but it's not always possible what you would like to do and what even may be legal. And this is, you know, where the sort of complexity of these situations uh, arise. So given the law is set out in the Mental Capacity Act and Code of pra uh, Practice, what particular problems might we anticipate when implementing the MCA in the context of supporting someone with Prader-Willi syndrome? And I want to just make a bit of a distinction here between what I think are sometimes strategic decisions about someone's life. These may be things about, you know, things like looking in the future, where is someone going to live and so on, where you've actually got time to try and work with them to help them begin to understand what is necessary and what is needed. You may not win that argument, but you have time. But there may also be situations where there are much more acute situations where someone is seriously uh, ill, for example, and is refusing treatment, where you have to make uh, instant actions. So a lot of this, if there's time, then there may be things that you can do that help them understand. You can give them experience of seeing a place where they might live, getting to see what it's like, and so on and so forth. Sorry, the, the um, uh, type has got a bit small here, I should. Um, there are some dilemmas in the approach here. There's the dilemma of restriction versus deprivation of liberty that I, I will come back to. There's the issue around the nature and extent of the, the decision in question, such as is this care uh, and where to live? Does it amount to treatment and a treatment program for a health condition? Is it about what to do in the context of an outburst, for example? There are dilemmas about who is making the decision and who requires that a judgment is made or is going to make that judgment about capacity. It may be on circumstances be the support worker. It may be the manager. It may be a social worker or care manager. It may be a doctor and so on. There's the dilemma about an unwise decision versus an incapacitous decision. All of us make, have probably made many unwise decisions in, in our lives. Uh, that doesn't mean we lack capacity. And the same is true for someone with Prader-Willi syndrome. So the fact they're doing something that you look at and you think, oh my God, that's awful. That's going to lead to, to weight gain or, or disaster doesn't in itself indicate that they lack, they lack capacity. And sometimes there's a real dilemma about should we judge this to be an unwise decision or is this an incapacitous uh, uh, decision? And then there's issues around what's legal and what is possible that I've referred to uh, already. Now, the decision maker, the who decides the decision maker, the person is the person requiring the decision to be made. That might be support staff, it may be a social worker who's working with the person about where they're going to live. It might be a health worker in terms of consent to take a course of treatment for pneumonia or whatever it, it happens to be. It can be others um, relating to the whole mental capacity, the court of protection and the office of the public garden, guardian. So it may be the donee of a lasting power of attorney and that's going to be uh, subject to a workshop uh, later. Or it may be a court, court appointed deputy or, the, or it may to come to the court of protection for their decision and for them to make a ruling. And they may be asked to make a ruling in very difficult situations where there's arguments on either side about whether in their judgment, based on the evidence they've received and they've heard, whether this person has capacity or not. And if they don't, what's in that person's best interest? And that can be a really important, ultimate, if you like, safeguard isn't quite the right word, but ultimate resource where things are going badly wrong. And I've seen situations where the authority of the court has been really powerful in helping this person with Prader-Willi syndrome who's refused everything else that everyone else suggested to accept that this is what's needed um, and to go along with it now and accept uh, the restrictions and, and life has been turned around by that. So I've seen some really useful situations where people have got as far as the court of protection um, and that might come up uh, later in discussion. So I mentioned an unwise decision. It's not by itself an indication of impaired capacity. Um, so for example, someone who believes he can diet by his own efforts and therefore wants access to his money and control over food. Um, uh, that, that one of the indicators there may be past behavior. Have they in the past had been situations where they've had their own money, 
and how have they responded to that. If they've used it to buy food, to go into restaurants, then you can begin to argue that actually maybe this is an incapacitous decision rather than just an unwise decision. So part of the whole process is, of course, the assessment of the person, assessing the views and wishes of the person with Prader-Willi syndrome, the context in which they live, their past history, have they previously coped with independence, and so on, so on, present circumstances, the observations and views of others, and any other relevant matters are all going to be important. And I've taken this from James Coding's MCA decision-making practice tool for Prader-Willi syndrome, which is uh, wonderful. And he's looked at some of the case law. Um, so, as, and I think one or two of these may, I may have been the witness, and I remember the expert, and in one of them I was torn apart by the barrister because I hadn't taken something into consideration, and that led to case law. And it was a real lesson for me. Uh, it's not one I wish to, wish to repeat, I have to say. He, he was a barrister who I think fancied himself in the Old Bailey, actually, <laughs> rather than in a small district magistrate's court. But, but he made a very important point. So you must be certain that an inability to make the decision is because of the impairment or disturbance of the functioning of the mind or brain, not because of some other emotional or psychological factor. So there must be, in this case, a link between Prader-Willi syndrome and the complications of Prader-Willi syndrome and incapacity. And it made the point of trying not to prejudge the person on the basis of their diagnosis. And that is important. Just simply because someone has Prader-Willi syndrome does not mean that they lack the capacity to make those decisions. It makes them that there is a much higher chance that they will lack capacity to make certain decisions because we know what we know about Prader-Willi syndrome. So in this case, the judge ruled that they felt he had capacity to make decisions. It was, a, it was where he lived type decision. But the judge very sensibly, I think, said, if circumstances change, we need to reconsider that. Um, and that's, for me, a really important issue, that just because someone is judged to have capacity, as I said at the beginning, your duties continue. Uh, the local authority, the health team involved, continue to have duties because that person may get into difficulties and you need to be there to help them out of that under those circumstances. So this is again from James's uh, document. Has the person tried to manage their eating and diet independently before? And if so, what was the outcome? If they haven't tried to manage independently before, can the per would the person willingly agree to some light touch observation and support? Um, and then there's, if there is evidence from the person's previous actions when managing their diet and food independently, have they been unable to carry out, carry into effect their plans for managing independently? Do they understand this? Do they have insight to what happened before? So I've seen people with Prader-Willi syndrome who said, I can manage my own food, I can manage this myself. And you say to them, well, I remember when you, I've been told when you were at living at so-and-so, this is what happened and you ended up in hospital because of being very obese. They said, no, 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 I could have managed. It wasn't my fault. It was because they didn't do this. That you can begin to see the disconnect. Um, and again, has the person in the past been able to show any evidence of being able to manage it? This is another judgment from um, related to the Liverpool City Council. And here, um, it would be artificial, indeed wrong in the case of CMW, not to consider re residency and care together. So that made the point that care was as much about where you live as well as the care that was being provided. And then went on to say it was her fundamental inability to grasp why she needs support and what would happen if she did not have it that underpins my finding that she lacks capacity in both these areas. She could not choose between packages of care because she seriously overestimated her ability to protect herself and seriously underestimated her own vulnerability. So that was a court protection ruling that judged this person with Prader-Willi syndrome uh, lacked the capacity to make decisions um, a, a, about her care and about where she lived. So I think really it's very important, and I just want to now bring things to sort of back and, and round to the end of the, of, of the talk. So in terms of care and support, of course, if one is making judgments about this, 
one has to ask questions about what areas and sort of support does the person with Prader-Willi syndrome need. Not everyone will necessarily need the same level of restrictions over food and so on. Who will be providing that and how will they provide it? What will happen if they do not have support and if they refuse it? And also, it's really important how the person can complain because I think if you are increasing restrictions on someone, then they need to have an opportunity to have independently be able to say, I'm not happy with this and so on. For people with Prader-Willi syndrome, they must have a basic, you want them to have a basic understanding of Prader-Willi syndrome. And that's part of the start of them having capacity. And I think our experience is increasingly, this younger generation of children with Prader-Willi syndrome do have that understanding. And there'll be a real important question about, will they be much more willing to accept restrictions in adult life because they understand the need for those restrictions. So they need to understand uh, that one effect of having Prader-Willi syndrome is to having a need to eat which is greater than the body's need for food. That to remain healthy, they'll need to present, prevent themselves from acting on their desire to eat and so on. So you can see, begin to see the sorts of level of understanding that people with Prader-Willi syndrome should have that I think the younger generation may have, and I think one should be looking towards a belief that maybe they will have more abilities to make these decisions and to make, if you like, sensible decisions in the future. Um, deprivation of liberty safeguards, I'm not going to go into in detail because of time, it's going to become the liberty protection safeguards uh, shortly, but this came in because of a very famous case, the case of Mr. H.L. that went as far as the European court and it really made the distinction between this idea of restricting someone's liberty, which, if they lack capacity, can be done lawfully, right, as long as the right criteria are met and the right procedures are followed, can be done lawfully within the framework of the Mental Capacity Act, and deprivation of liberty, which is a step further, which cannot be covered by the Mental Capacity Act, and there has to be separate legal pr um, proceedings, and that's what the case of HL identified when the UK was found at fault with a, a man with severe autism who was held in hospital, not under the Mental, uh, uh, the mental Health Act, um, uh, and it was judged that he was kept in hospital unlawfully. Um, so I'm just going to just skip to this one. So the starting point, and this is from the Supreme Court, that people with learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities, have the same human rights as everyone else, even though they may have limitations and restrictions due to their disability. That the right to physical liberty is guaranteed by Article 5 of the European, European Convention on Human Rights. And that it would be a deprivation if they were obliged to live in a particular place, subject to constant monitoring and control, only allowed out with close supervision, unable to move away without permission. And there's this phrase, um, which I think is a slightly unfortunate one. The fact that life is made as enjoyable as it could possibly be shouldn't, should make no difference. A gilded cage is still a cage. In other words, having restrictions as being in a cage is still being in a cage, even if it's a nice life. But the point being is that the Supreme Court set the criteria for deprivation and where, and for many people with Prader-Willi syndrome, their level of restrictions, which I would argue also give them increasing freedoms because it keeps them well and so on, but those levels of restrictions amount to deprivation and there's a process that has to be gone through in order to um, do that. So some final thoughts. I, I, I'm not myself so familiar with the new liberty protection safeguards, but they are linked much more closely to some of the principles of the CARE Act. There's this, this whole issue of managing an acute crisis, and I think this is something I haven't discussed, but I think we might want to bring up in discussion, is whether when someone is having an outburst, whether they actually might lose capacity, even if they had it before in the context of that outburst, and what is your duty of care and what can you legally do under those circumstances, the importance of the court of protection I, I've mentioned. But I also want to just say something about social care. I think this is one of the most challenging thing areas to work in and people who are supporting people with Prader-Willi syndrome, like you as families or for paid care workers in social care environments, it's a real, real challenge. 
And I was very struck by this bit taken from someone's PhD that a person with intellectual disabilities may include someone with prada willi syndrome is variably through viewed as an agent, so a person um, that is independent and able to make choices. That's what we're encouraged to do. But is also vulnerable and need to be safeguarded against risks, but other times as frightening and to be kept from harming others. And care staff have to juggle all these things. They have pra someone with prada willi syndrome who's clearly vulnerable. We, 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 we want them to be independent, but also at times they have outbursts that makes us scared. And how tough, how tough that is. Finally, this is taken from a paper by Kat Kathleen Liddell, who's a lawyer at the University of Cambridge, in which she uh, looked at the COVID uh, Act um, and asked questions, what is it, and there was a lot of challenges at the time with the restrictions that came in in care homes, primarily for older people with dementia uh, and excessive restrictions. But she, in this paper, she explores some of the important issues. And I just want to end with this. Clearly, she said, whether it's for the older people or for people with disabilities or for people with prada willi syndrome, you need to respect and support personal autonomy as far as you can. You need to protect their welfare, respect their privacy and human dignity, uphold equality, protect their liberty and their fundam fundamental rights to be free from torture and degrading treatment and so on. You need to act in a way that is justifiable and proportionate. There's a lot of argument that the, the COVID Act was disproportionate, but that's another, another matter. And that decisions should be transparent, accountable, open to independent scrutiny, but also there should be the fair allocations of resources because sometimes what happens is the restrictions are nothing to do with the Mental Capacity Act. They're, they're to do with the absence of the necessary resources to give that person the life uh, that they're uh, entitled to and just a couple of um, books and material. So thank you very much uh, for that. Very happy to answer any questions.